Hello and welcome to Mr. Tompkins EdTech and a brand new series of videos aimed at helping you prepare for your GCSE mathematics exams. In this series I'll be giving a complete walkthrough of the GCSE mathematics practice papers to help you prepare for your exams this summer. Now there are not so many of these and you don't want to squander them so make sure you try the paper yourself first before you look at these solutions. This particular paper is OCR November 2022, paper 2, Foundation Tier. Check the front cover of your paper to make sure it's the same one. If it's not, have a look through the playlist linked above which includes all the GCSE mass video walkthroughs I've recorded so far. I'm busy recording all of the GCSE practice papers, so if the one you're looking for isn't there already, why not subscribe by clicking the big red button below and check back in a few days. Don't forget to click on the bell so that you'll get a notification when I upload the next paper. I'll put timestamps in the description below so you can choose to watch the whole thing through or you can click on the timestamp and jump to the particular question you need help with. If you have a question, check the comments below as someone else might have already asked the same thing. If it's a new question, leave it in the comments and I will try and answer all of them as soon as I can. Don't forget to mention which question on the paper you're referring to and try and be as specific as possible. Finally, if this video helps you with your revision, please give it a thumbs up. It will really help me out and why not share the link with your friends because they might need a helping hand too. Okay, let's get into it. Question one, the pictogram shows the number of students absent from a school in a particular week. And the key says one whole circle represents four students. Harper says the pictogram shows two circles for Monday, therefore two students were absent on Monday. Explain why Harper is wrong. Write down the correct number of students who were absent on Monday. Well, it's because of this bit here, isn't it? So one of these circles here look, represents four students, not one student. So the fact you've got two of them, one, two there on Monday, means you've got two lots of four, and that should be eight then, shouldn't there? Eight people absent on Monday. So Harp has assumed that a circle represents one student, uh, when really it's four. So the correct number should be eight students. Five students were absent on Friday. Complete the pictogram to show this information. Well, five is one whole one, isn't it? One whole turn, because that represents four students. And we need to do like a, a quarter of one, don't we? A bit, like, uh, a bit like this one here. So this one would be four, eight, and that one is a ninth. So this one here, I've drawn here, that's going to be four. And we need one more, so we need like a quarter circle thing to draw next to it. So I'm going to draw my quarter circle here underneath the, the one above. Okay, so there's my quarter circle. It's not, not perfect, but it's, it's good enough. Okay. Question two, complete each statement by writing the missing power in the box. So six times six times six, that is six to the power of three. My box got a bit shifted in the print there, so it should be up there. 6 to the power 3, uh, and then 16 is 2 to the power what? Well, 2 by itself is 2 to the power 1. 2 squared is 4, cubed is 8, and then to the power 4 is going to be 16, then, isn't it? So that's 2 to the power of 4. And then work out 5 squared times the root of 36. Well, 5 squared is 25, and the root of 36, that's 6, isn't it? So 25 times 6, that is 150. One. Zero. Question three, work out 0.35 plus 6.2. So add in decimals, really you should line them up on the decimal point there. So if I add them up like that, lining up my decimal point first, I'm going to have to put an extra zero in at the end of the, the two there, 6.20, so it lines up with the 0 0.35, and then just add up uh, the columns. So that's going to be five, that's going to be five, that's going to be six. So it's going to be 6.55. 6.55. Uh, and then 4.8 divided by 8. What's that then? Well, 8 into 4.8. Uh, what's that? So 8 into 4 don't go. 8 into 48 go 6 times. So I'm going to get 0 
and that's 0 0.6 is my answer. Question four, part A. Write 19 over 4 as a mixed number. Well, 4 goes into 19, 4 times remainder 3. So the 4 times it goes in is the big number. The remainder of 3 is the numerator of the fractional part, and the denominator is the same as it was. It's still going to be a 4. So 4 and 3 quarters. Part B says write 1 and 7 ninths as an improper fraction. Uh, going back the other way, we multiply those together and then add that one on to the end. So 1 times 9 is 9, plus 7 is 16. So that's going to give me 16 over 9. Sam says that 7 eighths written as a decimal is not 0.78. Is Sam correct? Show how you decide. Uh, well, if it is, he's rounded it off. I don't think that's quite right. So anyway, let's, let's try and do it by long division. So I might have to add some extra zeros in. So 8s into 7 don't go, so that goes in 0 times. 8s into 70 does go, doesn't it? That goes um, 8 times. Okay, uh, that went in 8 times. Remainder, well, 8 8s are 64. So the difference between 64 and 70 is 6. 8s into 60, that goes uh, 7 times, doesn't it? 8 7s are 56, and the remainder is 4. And then 8s into 40 go 5 times. So it's 0 0.875 not 0 0.78 so he is wrong so is sam correct no because uh, it's equal to 0 0.875 okay question five write 36 as a product of its prime factors well if it was the calculator paper we could just get the calculator to do it for us but it isn't so we're gonna have to do it the long way uh, so I write 36 in a little circle like that, and I think about what two numbers multiply together to give me 36. got a few possibilities. I could have 6 and 6, or um, 3 and 12. doesn't really matter which combination you pick. You always end up with the same answer. Anyway, I'm going to go for 3 and 12. Now, 3 is prime, so I can stop on 3, but 12 is not. Uh, two numbers that multiply together to give me 12. Well, 4 times 3 equals 12, so 4 and 3. Now, again, 3 is prime, but 4 isn't. Four, I can break down into two and two, uh, which are both primes, okay? So then 36 is going to be equal to all those kind of leaves at the end, the prime numbers at the ends multiplied together. So it's gonna be two times two times three times three, two times two times three times three. You can always just double check this, two times two is four times three is 12 times three is, is 36, it does work. Question six, the diagram shows two intersecting straight lines. I've got angles B and A line on a straight line, and I've got 140. Now, find the value of A. Give your reason for your answer. Well, I can see straight away that A and the angle 140 are what we call vertically opposite. So, And vertically opposite angles are equal. So A is 140 because it is vertically opposite the... 140 degree angle okay uh, so then find the value of B now A and B lie on a straight line or B and 140 lie on a straight line so I know that those two add up to 180 so B must be equal to 40 because a 40 and 140 is 180 so the reason is 40 and because angles on a straight line sum to 180 degrees okay that's my reason question seven find the value of 4x plus 5y when x is 3 and y is negative 2 now this is a substitution question we're going to take these values of x and y and we're going to replace them where we see the x and the y in the in the in the expression here okay so 4x is going to be 4 lots of 3, because x is 3. So replacing x with the value of x. And then 5 lots of y is going to be 5 lots of negative 2, then, isn't it? Because I'm replacing y with the value of y there. Okay. So then we just need to multiply that out and then add them together. So 4 3 is a 12. Uh, and 5 lots of negative 2. Well, that's minus 10, isn't it? And then 12 take away 10, that's 2. Okay, so that's my answer. Question 8a, write 65% as a fraction in its simplest form. Well, percent means out of 100. 
So I can rewrite 65% as 65 over 100 and then look to, to cancel. Now 65 and 100 have got a common factor of, of 5. So if I divide top and bottom by 5, I should cancel it down, shouldn't I? 100 divided by 5 is 20, that's easy. 5 is into 65, I think that's 13, isn't it? So it's going to be 13 over 20. Part B says 25 people entered a competition. Four of them won a prize. Work out the percentage of people that won a prize. Okay, so it's going to be 4 out of 25 as a fraction. Now, going back from a fraction to a percentage, I, really, I need, just need to change the denominator into hundreds, don't I, from 25. So I just need to change this back into a fraction over 100. And now 25 goes into 100 four times, so multiplying the top by 4 as well, I'm going to get 16 over 100 as a fraction. And then that as a percentage then is just going to be 16%. Part C says increase 250 by 20%. Now, if I know that 100% is equal to 250, then 10% is going to be a tenth of that, isn't it? It's going to be 25. And another 10% is also going to be 25. And if I add all those together, 100, 10, and 10, that gives me 120%. And if I add 25, 25, and 250, that comes to 300. Okay, so, yeah. That's my answer then, 300. Okay, because when you increase by 20%, you're going to end up with 20% on top of your original 100% or 120%. Question 9a. By writing each number correct to one significant figure, find an estimate of 79.8 times 3.1. Okay, so we need to do this to one significant figure. Now, the first significant figure of 79.8 is that 7 there. Now, that's in the tens column. So that means I need to round this one off to the nearest 10. So 79.8 to the nearest 10 is going to be 80. And then on the second number, 3.1, the first significant figure is at 3, which is in the units column. So that means I need to round this one off to the nearest unit or to the nearest whole number. So 3.1 to the nearest whole number is going to be 3. 80 times 3, that's 240. Okay, so 240 is going to be my estimate there. Part B says, Jamie works out 79.8 times 3.1 on the calculator. Jamie's answer is 2473.8. Do you think Jamie has used the calculator correctly? Explain why. Okay, now our estimate of this number was 240, which is uh, quite a lot less than 2473, isn't it? So our estimate isn't going to be spot on, but it's going to be close to the number. So it's, it's not, there's no way it can be that big. It needs to be in the hundreds, not in the thousands. So I'm going to say that no, he's not used it correctly uh, because his answer is 10 times bigger than the estimate. Okay. Question 10. Ashley has £7 to spend on fruit. The table shows the prices. So pineapples cost £1.15 each. Bananas cost 70p for a kilogram. And strawberries for a pack of 200 grams. It's £1.30. Ashley buys two pineapples, three kilograms of bananas. Ashley spends the remaining money on strawberries. Work out the mass in grams of strawberries that Ashley buys. You must show your working. Okay. So let's, let's just work out how much she spent on the pineapples and bananas first. So if she bought two pineapples, I'm going to multiply the cost of one pineapple by two, aren't I? And if she bought three kilograms of bananas, I'm going to have to multiply that one by three. Okay, so two lots of £1.15, that's £2.30. And three lots of 70p, that's £2.10, isn't it? So that adds up to £4.40, okay? So and then how much is left out of £7? So £7 minus £4.40, that leaves me with zero or one from there, um, six, two, £2.60 in change then, okay? So I've got £2.60 in order to buy strawberries. Now strawberries come in packs of 
200 grams and they cost £1.30. So I can afford two of those then, can't I? So two lots of £1.30, uh, two times £1.30 is equal to £2.60, so I can afford two. Okay, so I've got two punnets of strawberries. That, now each one weighs 200 grams, so two times 200, that's 400, isn't it then? So that is the number of grams then it weighs. It weighs 400 grams. Question 11a, sketch the graph of y equals minus 2. Show clearly the value of any intercepts. Okay, now y equals minus 2 is going to be a straight line, and it's going to be a straight line parallel to the x-axis. They're always horizontal lines, lines that are y equal to something. x equals something are, are vertical, and y equals something is horizontal. So we're going to do like a, a horizontal line here. Okay, horizontal line parallel to the x-axis and that point there where it passes through the y-axis is that's going to be our minus 2 so I'm going to label that one here as minus 2 okay so that's my sketch of that one part b says sketch the graph of y equals x minus 3 show clearly the value of any intercepts uh, now again this is going to be a straight line graph but it's a kind of a slant line isn't it now Equations normally have the form y is equal to mx plus c, where m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept. Now I can see from here my m value, there is no number in front of x, so the gradient is going to be 1, uh, and the y-intercept, c, is going to be that part there, it's going to be minus 3. Okay, so that means that this line is going to pass through the point... Um, y is equal to minus 3 and it's going to be slanted at about a 45 degree angle because that's a gradient of 1. For every 1 you go along you go 1 up. Okay, So I'm going to have a line that looks something like this. Okay, Now I've got another intercept here. So if it's gone 1 along 1 up, 1 along 1 up, 1 along 1 up, by the time it gets to the x-axis here we've gone 3 units along, 3 units up, so that one there must be a 3 as well. So that is x equals 3 there, where it passes through again. Okay, So that's my graph of y equals x minus 3. Part C says sketch the graph of y equals x squared. Now that is going to be a parabola, isn't it? A U-shaped graph. Uh, and because there's no number on the end, it's going to pass through the origin. Because when x is 0, 0 squared is 0. So it's going to pass through the origin here. okay, uh, And it's going to look like a U-shaped parabola. Something like that, okay? Uh, so then, yeah, so that's the point zero, zero that it passes through. I think it's already labeled, so I don't really need to label that one. So when you're sketching the parabola, just try and make sure that it is vaguely symmetrical down the middle. So you should be able to fold it in half and one land on top of the other half. Um, just take care that it doesn't kind of woo out at the top or it doesn't have like pointy bottom or a flat bottom when you draw it, okay? Uh, they're the things that get you marked down. Question 12, multiply out three lots of x plus one. So when you've got something on the outside of the bracket like here and want to remove the brackets, everything on the, the inside of the bracket gets multiplied by that thing on the outside. So I'm going to multiply x and 1 by 3. So 3 times x is 3x and 3 times 1 is 3. So my answer is 3x plus 3. Uh, similarly on the second one, I'm going to multiply everything in the bracket by this 3d. So 3d times d. That's going to be d squared, or 3d squared, sorry. And then when I multiply 3d by minus 2, that's going to give me minus 6d. So 3d squared minus 6d. Question 13, work out 3 sevenths times 2. Now, if I rewrite 2 as 2 over 1, then we can just use our basic rules for multiplying fractions together. So 3 times 2 that's equal to 6, and 7 times 1, that's equal to 7. So the answer is 6 over 7. And with the second one, 2 thirds minus 1 quarter. Now when you subtract and add fractions, you need the same denominator, don't you? You need to have a common denominator. And if they're not the same, then we need to kind of scale up our numbers uh, top and bottom first. So what number does 3 and 4 both go into? Both go into 12. So if I can rewrite my fractions as twelfths, then I can go ahead and do the subtraction. Now, 3 goes into 12 four times. So multiplying top and bottom by 4, 
that's going to give me 8 twelfths. And 4 goes into 12 3 times, so multiplying top and bottom by 3, that's going to give me 3 twelfths. Okay? So I've got 8 twelfths minus 3 twelfths. 8 subtract 3 is 5, so my answer is going to be 5 twelfths. 5 over 12. Question 14. Solve 6x minus 9 is equal to 27 minus 4x. Now this is one of the hardest types of linear equations to solve because you've got unknowns on both sides here. I've got a 6x over here and a minus 4x over here. Okay. Now when, you, when you've got this situation, what you want to do is add or subtract the smaller one of the two to both sides so that you end up with just x's on one side. So if I add 4x to this side, these will cancel. If I add 4x to this side, I'm going to get 10x on, on, the, on the left. So 10x minus 9 is equal to 27. Okay, uh, And then I've got a more simple looking linear equation now. If I add 9 to both sides, they'll cancel, leave me with just a 10x on the left. So 10x is equal to 27 plus 9 is 36. And then finally, I'm going to have to divide both sides through by 10, aren't I? That leave me with x on the left, and three, 36 divided by 10, that's just going to be 3.6, and that's going to be my answer, 3.6. Question 15. Kai invests £600 at a simple interest rate of R% each year. After five years, Kai's investment is worth £690. Find the value of R. Okay, so we can see that his investment has risen from 600 to 690 pounds, isn't it? So that is an increase of 90 pounds, okay? So what is 90 pounds as a percentage of 600? Well, I can see that if you've got 100% is 600, then 10% of that would be 60, and 5% of that would be 30, wouldn't it? So 10 and 5 together makes 15%. So that means that uh, 90 represents a 15% increase, okay? So that is an increase of 15%, okay? So if 15% is uh, what he gets over five years, uh, with simple interest, it means you just get the same amount each year. So if I just divide that by five, so R then, the percentage rate he's gonna get each year is gonna be that 15% divided by 5, isn't it? Because he's got 50% overall over the 5 years. So that means R must be equal to 3. Okay, it's not 3%, it's 3 because the percentage sign is written after the R, isn't it? So it's going to be 3 and not 3%. R equals 3. Question 16. The diagram shows part of a regular 12-sided polygon. For this polygon, find the ratio of size of one exterior angle to the size of one interior angle. Give your answer in its simplest form. You must show your work in. Okay. Well, there are uh, two formulas that you can use for exterior and interior regular angles. So you can use the fact that the exterior angles is going to be 360 because they always add up to 360 divided by the number of sides. And because it's a 12-sided uh, polygon, we're going to be divided here by 12. So 12 into 360 goes 30 times. So that means each exterior angle is going to be 30. Now there's a formula for working out interior angles as well. So in one interior angle is n minus 2 times 180 divided by n. And it's a bit more of a complicated formula. It's, but actually, because we already know what the exterior angle is, we don't really need to use this more complicated one. I tend to just use the exterior angle formula because it's nice and easy. It's always 360 divided by a number of sides. Quite simple and straightforward to use. Now, once you find the exterior angle, you can use the fact that an exterior angle and an interior angle always lie in a straight line. So if I extend this line off a little bit, then this angle here, look, that's, that's my 30 degree angle. So the rest of this angle off that straight line is going to be uh, 180 minus 30. So one interior angle is going to be uh, 180 minus 30, and that's going to be 150. Okay, so that's 150. And then, so to find the ratio, then we need to find the ratio of the one exterior angle to one interior angle. So we're doing 
exterior to interior, aren't we? So the exterior we found to be 30. The interior angle we've decided was 150. Now just divide them both by 10 to start with. I got 3 and 15. And then dividing both of those by 3, that counts us down to 1 in 5 then, doesn't it? Okay, so that's the simplest form, 1 to 5. Question 17, a straight line L is shown below. Write down the ratio of V to H when the gradient of the line is 4. Okay, so V to H. V is the, the rise, isn't it? It's this bit here. It's the vertical part. And H is this part here. That's the horizontal part. Okay, so we want the ratio of the vertical to the horizontal. Now, if the gradient is 4, that means the change in y divided by the change in x is 4. And we already know what, uh, that if I take v and I divide it by h, I'm going to get the gradient of 4, isn't it? Because the gradient is change in y divided by change in x. So if v divided by h is 4, then that means that v is equal to 4h, just rearranging that. So v is 4 times bigger than h. So let's say h was 1. I'm going to write, say, if h equals 1, then v must be equal to 4, because it's 4 times bigger. So then the, ra uh, the ratio of v to h, then, is going to be 4 to 1, like that. Uh, part b says, find the gradient of the line L as a fraction in its simplest form when v to h is 14 to 6. Okay, so again, gradient is change in y, 14, divided by change in x, 6. So we want to write this down as a fraction in its simplest form. Well, they're both divisible by 2, aren't they? So that's going to be 7 over 3 then, isn't it? 7 thirds. Okay, don't really need to write it as a, uh, a mixed number. Top every fractions are fine. 7 thirds is the answer. Question 18. Find all the possible integer values that satisfy the inequality. 4 is less than or equal to 2x, which is less than 10. Right, now notice you've got 2x in the middle, not just x. But if we divide everything by 2, first off, then I'm going to get 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 5. Now, if I was to draw that on a number line, 2, 3, 4, 5, then I would have to have a circle at 2, a circle at 5, and a line between them like that, wouldn't I, if I was going to draw this. Now I can fill in the 2, because 2 is part of the range, but the other one, the 5, is going to be open, isn't it, because that's not part of the range. So which numbers are part of the, the range of, uh, of this inequality then? It's going to be this one, this is part of it, this is part of it, this is part of it. The 5, not part of it, okay? So it's going to be the numbers 2, 3, and 4. 2, 3, and 4. Question three, as me spins the spinner twice and adds the two scores to get a total, complete the table to show all the possible totals. Well, you can see that the spinner's got the numbers two, five, and eight on it. So we've got two, five, and eight along the top and two, five, eight down the side. So then the numbers in the middle are going to be what you get by adding the two numbers at the top of the row and to the left of the column like that. So that two and two make four. Okay, so then the number on the end here, in this, this square here, that's going to be the sum of 2 and 8, isn't it? So 2 plus 8 is going to be 10. And similarly, uh, 5 and 8 make 13, and 2 and 8 make 10. So completing the table like that, got 10, 13, 10. Uh, find the probability that the total is a square number. Right, so the probability that it is a square, well... When you work out the probability, it's successful outcomes divided by total outcomes. Now, how many outcomes are there altogether in this question? Well, each outcome is each one of the cells in the table, and there's a 3 by 3 grid that gives you a total of 9 different outcomes. Okay, so the denominator is 9. And now the numerator is going to be the successful outcomes. And in this case, success means that it's a square number. Okay, let's just get rid of that. So um, which one of those numbers are squares? Well, if you think about the square numbers, the square numbers are 1, 4, 9, and then 16 then, aren't they? It doesn't go any higher than 16. So have we got any 1s, 4s, 9s, and 16s in our tables? Well, we've got 4 there, and we've got a 16. Have we got any others? Nope, no 9s. 
no ones, just one four and one sixteen. So altogether, there are two outcomes that happen to be square numbers. So then the uh, the probability of success is two over nine. Two successful outcomes, two squares over a total of nine different outcomes. Question four: Layla and Jamal open a box of sweets. Layla and Jamal share all the sweets in a ratio of two to three. Write down the fraction of sweets that Layla receives. Okay. So we want to turn that ratio into a fraction. Uh, now, if Layla gets two shares and Jamal gets three shares, then altogether there are two plus three equals five shares. Okay. So then what fraction does Layla receive? She, re she received her two shares out of a total of five shares. So um, basically she's got two fifths of the total, hasn't she? Now, part B says, Layla eats some of her sweets. She is then left with 18% of the sweets that were in the box. Work out the percentage of her sweets that Layla has eaten. Now, these questions where they don't actually tell you the total, uh, they do throw students a little bit. Uh, now, there's no evidence anywhere in here of how many sweets are in the box. Um, and so you just have to kind of assign it a value. Uh, I'm just going to assume, assume that there are 100 sweets. Now if they're not 100 sweets then it should still follow the same ratios so it's not really a problem. Okay so uh, if I if I assume there are 100 sweets then then Layla's share she's going to get like 100 sweets times her, her, her fraction of two fifths isn't it? So what's 100 times 2 fifths? Well, 5 goes into 100 20 times, and 20 times 2, that's 40. So she gets 40 sweets. Okay, so she, let's say, if, assuming that they got 100, might not be. Okay, so then if she's left with 18 sweets, so how many has she eaten? So she's eaten her 40 sweets, minus the 18 sweets that are remaining. So that means that she ate 22 sweets. So then the percentage of her sweets that she's eaten that's going to be the 22 sweets that she ate out of the total 40 sweets that she had to start with. Now, what's that as a percentage? If you want to get an answer percentage, we need to get it as a fraction over 100. 40 doesn't immediately go into 100, but if I divide it by 2 first and get it as a fraction over 20, then that's going to be like 11 over 20. And then if I times that by 5, I'm going to get that as a fraction over 100. That's 55 over 100. And then 55 over 100. I can definitely write as a percentage, it's 55% then, isn't it? Okay. Question six. The graph shows information about the population of a village. And we've got population written in thousands up the side. And we've got years running from 2015 to 2022 along the bottom. Although the graph seems to stop at 2020. Right. The population of the village in 2021 was 4,740 plot this point on the graph. Okay, so we've got an extra one to plot on. Uh, 4,740. 4, now note these are in thousands here. So that 4.7 there is 4,700. Uh, and the 4.8 is 4,800. Uh, and there are five divisions in between. So each one of those must be 20. So I want to go two divisions above 4.7 to plot my point for 2021. So I think mine goes about there. Okay, uh, right, so then I should really join that up with a straight line because, well, a dash line, not a dash straight line, because that's what's happening. Let me just dash my way up to 2021. Okay, that'll do. Uh, right, so that's the first bit done. Work out the increase in the population of the village between 2016 and 2018. Okay, so what was the population in 2016? In 2016, it was here, look, which is two little squares below 4.2. Now remember, each one of those was 
20 so that'd be like 40 below 4200 so that's 4160 there and then the other one at 2018 that's up here now now that is one little square below 4.5 so 4,500 minus 20, that would be 4,480, okay? So how far is it between these two values then? We're, we're, what we're interested in is the difference then, aren't we, of those two numbers? So what is 4,480 minus 4,160? Well, I'm just going to do a straightforward subtraction. So that's given me 320 difference. So 320. Part C says, Rowan says that there was a huge increase in the population of the village between 2015 and 2020. Describe how Rowan may have been misled by the graph. Well, I think what he's thinking of is, well, if you look at 2015, the height of the of the bar is pretty low look it's just like this little wibbly bit here and then if you're looking at this that looks like loads taller but actually what's been what's gone on here is that the graph isn't starting at zero we're already at 4,000 uh, and we've just increased to 4,700 which is you know it is an increase but is it a is it a massive increase no it's not a massive increase so I think he's been misled by the fact that there is a broken scale and it hasn't been marked um, so the graph uses an unmarked broken scale starting at 4,000 and not zero. Blake says the population of the village will be greater than 4,800 in 2022 write down an assumption that Blake has made. So for it to go above 4,800, which is, which would be here, isn't it? So he's expecting the graph to go above that, okay? So what is he expecting to happen then? Well, I guess what he's expecting, if it's to go above 4,000, he's expecting it to kind of carry on in the same way as it has for the last couple of years, okay? or the kind of general trend line. So if you look at four, four point, uh, so from 2015 up to 2021, and kind of drew a line, then you can see that it's kind of, yeah, it's gonna go above 4,800, as long as it carries on the same way. So he's assumed then that uh, population growth will remain constant. Population growth will stay similar to previous years. Okay, so he's assumed that it's going to be the same as previous years. Now, it might not happen. It might Something might happen in the village. Maybe it's midsummer. Someone's been murdered and everyone leaves. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, can't, can't just say it's happened like that for the last few years, so it's definitely going to happen like that in the future. Other factors may apply. Okay, so there we go. Question eight, the diagram shows a cylinder with radius 15 centimeters and height 20 centimeters. On the grid below, draw the plan view of the cylinder. Use the scale of one centimeter to represent five centimeters. Okay, so what is the plan view? So if I've got an object, uh, then the plan view is the view, I, you can either consider it like to be the bird's eye view, the view if you were flying over and looking down, Another way of thinking about it is if you imagine it was a cookie, cookie cutter and you stamped it into the ground, uh, then it's the shape that the co cookie cutter would leave in the ground. Uh, so that's another way of thinking about it. So it's either like the footprint or the aerial view looking down on your shape. Either way, it's going to be a circle, isn't it? Because if you looked straight down on this object here, you're going to be looking down on that circular um, top. So what we need to do is show that circle on the diagram. Now we need to be using a scale of one centimeter represents five centimeters on the on the actual thing. So if I picked a point in the middle, which is going to be the center of my circle, then that 15 centimeter radius would take me out to three squares. It'd be out to here, wouldn't it? So I need to draw a circle 
uh, that is centered there and it goes through there. Now I think I could do it with my, my little tool here, but obviously for you, you're gonna have to draw it uh, with a compass and a pencil carefully, like what I'm doing, but with your compass and your pencil, not your electronic one. But anyway, it should look something like that if you do it nicely with your with your compass and your pencil, okay? Now part B says, on the grid below, draw the front elevation of your cylinder uh, using the same scale. So the front elevation would be kind of looking at it from this angle. So if you were like uh, walking past it and looked up at the building, what would you see? Now I think what you would see is, you'd see this section, wouldn't you, if you look in, and it wouldn't look round though, it looked kind of straight like a rectangle. So it's going to look like a rectangle, which has the same height as my shape, 20 centimeters and the distance that you would see from here to here is going to distance is the diameter of your of your circle isn't it? it's going to be 30 in that direction so we're going to have a rectangle which is 30 by 20 in reality now if we're using the scale of five centimeters or one we're going to divide that by five so that's going to be six and that's going to be four so we need to draw a rectangle which is six by four basically so six by four it's going to be from so let's say this was the top left corner, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. Uh, then I should be drawing a, a rectangle using my rectangle tool from there down to there. Now you're gonna be using a ruler and a pencil. Okay, mine kind of looks like that. Let's just make it a little bit bigger. Okay, yeah, so it's gonna look like that. Six by four like that. Now, I do recommend that you like do a little sketch like this before you start drawing on your square grid. Uh, the reason for that is that you've only got one little square grid, and if you fluff it up, fluff it up, then uh, then obviously it's a problem. So I would just do a little sketch on the side first, get all your dimensions right, and get the idea of what the shape looks like in your head, and then draw it neatly in the grid. Okay. Question nine, a student says that they have placed the following values in order, starting with the smallest. Has the student done this correctly? Show how you decide. Okay, so we're gonna to have to evaluate each one of these things and make sure they are actually in the right order. Okay, so let's have a look at the first one, one over 10 all squared. Now, when you've got a, a power on the outside of a bracket like this and you've got a quotient or a fraction on the inside, the power gets distributed to both parts. So it's going to be 1 squared over 10 squared, which is the same thing as 1 over 100 there, isn't it? So that's 1 one hundredth. Okay, as a decimal, that's going to be 0 0.01. Uh, now, root of 0 0.25. Okay, similarly, well, I can write 0 0.25 as a fraction. That's 1 quarter, isn't it? Now, 1 quarter square rooted, that's the same thing as root 1 over root 4 then isn't it again so applying the root to both parts of the fraction that's the same thing as 1 over 2 which is 0 0.5 okay so that's substantially bigger than the first one so they're all looking good and then I've got 4 to the minus 1 4 to a negative index is the same as 1 over the same number to a positive index that's the same thing as 1 over 4 to the 1 or just a quarter which is the decimal is 0 0.25, okay? So that's a slight problem because uh, root 0 0.25 is actually bigger than four to the minus one, and so uh, she's got it the wrong way around. So is it done correctly? No, because root of 0 0.25 is bigger than four to the minus one, so correct order is one tenth squared four to the minus one and then the root of 0 0.25 okay question 24 alex has a bag containing three blue beads and five green beads there are no other beads in the bag alex takes a bead at random from the bag puts it back and then takes another bead Alex says the probability that two beads of the same colour is less than 50%. Is Alex correct? Show how you decide. You may use this tree diagram if you wish. Yes, I do wish. 
Okay, so to 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 do this um, tree diagram, so for the first bead, it could either be blue or it could be green, couldn't it? So I've got blue here, green here. Now in the bag, there are three blue and five green. So that's a total of eight beads in the bag. So the probability you're gonna pull out a blue one is gonna be three out of eight then, isn't it? And the probability of green one is gonna be five out of eight. Now, for the second selection, I'm gonna get blue, green, blue, green. Now this is gonna be independent probability because, because the bead goes back, that means the probability of getting a blue or a green um, bead on any draw in any location is going to be the same. So the probability is just going to be the same on this arm as well. Three apes, five apes, three apes, five apes. Okay. Now, we are interested in the, the outcomes where you get the same color for both selections. So there's two possible routes through there. You could get the blue-blue route. This one here, that would end up with two blues. Or it could be this one, this route, this route, uh, which ends up with two greens. Okay, either way, you've got the same color for both drawers, haven't you? Okay, now the probability of blue, blue, just following that down, and that's three apes times three apes, three apes times three apes. And uh, that's going to be 9 over 64 then, top, multiplying top to top, bottom to bottom. And then green, green, that's going to be my 5 apes times my 5 apes there, isn't it? So 5 apes times 5 apes. Uh, and that is equal to 25 over 64. Okay. So what is the combined probability then? So the probability then that they're the same that's going to be the probability of blue blue plus the probability of green green. Uh, blue blue we worked out as 9 over 64. Green green we worked as 25 out of 64. So combining those together that's going to give me a probability of 34 out of 64. Now is that less than 50%? Is it less than 50%? Well, 50% would be half 64 out of 64, wouldn't it? It'd be 32 out of 64. We got 34 out of 64. So that's slightly more than 50%. Okay, so is he right? No, he's not. Alex is not right. Okay, and the reason is uh, probability of them being the same is 34 out of 64, uh, which is greater than 50%, which would be 32 out of 64, okay? So 34 out of 64 is greater than 32 out of 64, okay? That's how I'm deciding. Question 25, the diagram shows a right angle triangle and a rectangle. Yes, it does. Uh, the triangle and the rectangle have the same area. Calculate the length d centimeters of the diagonal of the rectangle. You must show your work here. Okay, so the diagonal that we want to find is this one over here. Look, uh, but to do that, we're going to have to know what this side of the rectangle is first. Uh, and to get that, we're going to have to know the area of the rectangle first. And to get that, we're going to have to work out the area of the triangle first. Okay, so we're going to start with the area of the triangle. So the area of the triangle. That is going to be equal to, well, the formula is half times base times height, isn't it? So that's going to be a half times the base, which is 24, look, that's that one there. And the height is 4, so that's going to go there. So 24 times 4. Okay, so half of 4 is 2, 2 lots of 24, that's 48. So the area of the triangle is going to be 48. So the area of the rectangle... Now that's going to be length times width. Now I know that the length is eight, but I don't know the width, so I'm just gonna write W for now. But I do know that the area is the same as the area of the triangle, so that's gonna be equal to 48. So eight times the width is 48, which means the width must be 48 divided by eight. The width of this rectangle must be six. 
So that one over there must be six then, okay? Uh, so now I know that that one is six, I can now start thinking about what D must be. Now I've got a right angle triangle here, uh, and I wanna know the hypotenuse, the longest side of that right angle triangle, and I know the other two sides. So this sounds to me like a job for Pythagoras theorem. So using Pythagoras theorem, I'm gonna use that C squared equals A squared plus B squared. In this case, our C is actually D, isn't it? It's D squared. D squared equals A squared, which is eight squared plus six squared. Uh, what's that then? Eight squared is equal to 64. Six squared is equal to 36. Add them together, you're gonna get 100. Uh, but remember that's D squared, and we want D, so we're gonna have to root that to get our answer. What's the square root of 100? D is gonna be equal to 10. You can find more exam question compilations over here. For more past paper walkthroughs, click down here. If you want to visit my Amazon shop with my recommendations for calculators, revision guides and other maths related stuff, click down here. Good luck in your revision and in your exams and see you again.